Here at New Heights, uh, we believe in a thing called expository preaching. And what that is, is we take a book of the Bible and we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the entire book. And so if you're new here, maybe you've only been coming a couple of weeks, we are currently going through the book of Genesis. Um, Our our series, if you will, is, is titled Saints and Villains as we look at these key characters throughout history and see uh, their lives, what they've done, and, and kind of what implications that has for us. And so if you have your phone or your Bible, turn it on and turn to Genesis. We're going to be covering two chapters today, uh, chapters 10 and 11, and there is a lot of genealogy, okay? So hang with us as we go through it. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there that we're going to pull out of there, though. But go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 10 and 11. And that's what we're going to be covering today. If you take notes, there are three points that we're going to be looking at. First is theology and the genealogy. Second is we see man's disobedience. And then lastly, we're going to see God's mercy. Uh, Let's go ahead and pray and then dive in. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you that we can come here and freely worship you this morning. I pray that as we open up your word and read this text from Genesis, that you convict us where we need convicted. You show us uh, where we need to change in our life to be more like you. Lord, I pray that you show us your will for our lives and that we're obedient to that this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, as you make your way to Genesis 10 and 11, I talked about there's a lot of genealogy. Uh, All of chapter 10 is a genealogy, and then the end of chapter 11 is a genealogy as well. And so we're going to see a couple of things throughout this text. So we're going to kind of summarize parts of it and read some of the scripture. Um, But I want to explain as we dive in what the purpose or what the reason of a genealogy is there for. Um, There are multiple genealogies throughout scripture. And anytime you see a genealogy, each one has a different uh, point that the author is trying to make the reader aware of. So when you read a genealogy, one, you have simply history, a historical record of who came next in different lines of families, uh, what those families did, where they ended up geographically. Throughout genealogies, you see this continuity of how God works within the family role. Uh, You see genealogies used as a a way to bridge gaps between major events, such as last week we talked about the flood. This week we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel, and in between those events are this genealogy explaining the descendants of Noah and kind of where they went and what happened next. Um, Another purpose of genealogies is to show some form of theological view whether that be a view of these families, what they represent, what we see each of Noah's sons do and where they went and how God uses them differently within his will. Or we see a theological view of our depravity, our constant need for God's grace, his mercy, our repentance. And the fact is this genealogy is in between two major events in which we see man's evil on display. And so this genealogy serves as a reminder that not a couple generations go by and God is already upset with man's wickedness. And so we see a reminder of our depravity and our need for grace. So chapter 10 is broken into three categories. You have three individuals, which is the three sons of Noah. You have Japheth, you have Ham, and you have Shem. Japheth covers verses 2 through 5, Ham covers 6 through 20, and Shem covers 21 through 31. Uh, If you read the text, it shows where each ended up geographically, and it names their sons and their sons' sons, and so on. And so one thing that we learn here is Noah having three sons. We see this difference in how quickly these sons each went a different way. And not too long into this genealogy do we see how quickly separated from God these generations are becoming, and it serves as a reminder to us the importance of teaching our family, teaching our kids and raising them in the gospel, grounding them in the faith. See, in one generation, you can go from a family that loves Christ to the next having a family that has nothing to do with Christ. And so this serves as a reminder that we are called to teach our family and ground them in the gospel. So as we cover the first individual, Japheth, We see here in the text, and we can study from Japheth, where he ends up, where uh, his descendants, if you will, multiplied on the earth in parts of the world. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, says, From these the coastland peoples spread in their lands, 
each with his own language, by their clans and in their nations. And so although not much is mentioned about this guy named Japheth, we see that he is uh, the, one of the three individuals. He actually kind of spreads out farther than the other two sons. The other two sons we're going to see here in a minute is uh, there's a dividing wall, if you will, between those two, where the descendants of Ham ends up being known as the enemies of Israel, and the descendants of Shem is known as the ancestors of Israel. And Japheth here is kind of in the middle. He goes to what it says uh, in the English Standard Version, the coastland people. Uh, In other versions, it explains this as the Isles of the Gentiles. And so, although not much is mentioned here in this individual, Moses, the author, does include where he ends up, which we're going to see here shortly, um, helps explain to us a theological understanding of what is happening with this line of people, these descendants. Isaiah kind of helps explain it a little bit more. Isaiah 42, verse 4, says, He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. In the coastlands, wait for his law. So within these three groups of people, you have Japheth's, uh, his descendants go to the isles of the Gentiles as they wait for the coming law, as they wait for the engrafting in of the Gentiles into the promised line of Israel. We see Ham's descendants ends up being the, uh, the enemies of Israel. And so moving on, we're going to talk a little bit more about Ham's descendants. Verses 6 through 20 covers this. And a couple of things is to be noticed from these verses. So we see from Ham a couple of things. Ham and Shem are the two individuals here in the genealogy. Um, one is going to represent the Canaanites. This is where Ham's descendants end up, which Canaan is the land here in a couple hundred years when this guy named Abram makes his way to the scene. Canaan is the land that God promises Abram. So God says, hey, Abram, I'm going to take you out of this pagan land. I'm going to make a nation out of you. From your seed and your descendant, I'm going to bring the Redeemer who's going to redeem all people, and I'm going to give you this land. And so we see this happen, that when God divides and spreads these individuals out, the individuals that first get this land that's going to be known as the promised land goes to the enemies of Israel. So we see Ham ends up in Canaan eventually. And so we see Ham within the will of God is the family that ends up getting the better land, the very land that God will eventually promise to the descendants of Shem years to come. And so we see God is in control of all things, and he knows what he's doing when he divides these lands up. In fact, Deuteronomy 32, 8, it explains, it says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So Scripture explains to us that God is in control regardless of what we think is fair and what's not fair. So Scripture reminds us that we serve a God who does work things out for His glory. John Calvin on this point states, Besides, we must observe that the children of this world are exalted for a time, so that the whole earth seems as if it were made for their benefit. But their glory being transient vanishes away while the church in an ignoble and despised condition, as if creeping on the ground, is yet divinely preserved until at length in his own time God shall lift up her head. And so we're reminded through this story as we see these descendants spread into different geographical areas across the world, we're reminded that that God's timing is better than our own timing. In our own sinful timing, we want often the easier path. The better land, the nicer things, the more comfortable life. We want a life that is less hard. We see God does not always give us the easier life. But we're reminded that God will always give us the life that's going to make us more like him. And so we see in this text that our holiness is more important to God than our happiness. Matthew Henry states to this point, Note, a family of saints is more truly honorable than a family of nobles. Shem's holy seed than Ham's holy seed. Jacob's 12 patriarchs than Ishmael's 12 princes. That is, that although Ham got the better land, it is better to be in the family of God than of nobles. Another major thing we see from Ham's line is uh, that kind of helps pave the way and explain a little bit of chapter 11 is we see this guy Nimrod come on the scene. So uh, chapter 10, verses 6 through 10, it says, The sons of Ham, 
was Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush was Seba, Havilia, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabtica. The sons of Ramah was Sheba and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. So we see Nimrod was the son of Cush. It says he was a mighty one on the earth. Nimrod was known throughout history to be a great hunter. He was known to be a great ruler. He was known to be a great builder, great architect. And it tells us that the beginning of his kingdom was this place called Babel, which we're going to see here soon. And so I want to explain something. When it talks about this guy named Nimrod and who he is, I want to explain that when it says that he was a mighty one, it was not a mighty one in the sense of anything good, but rather quite the opposite. When you look at the, the history of this individual, one commentator writes, one son of Cush worthy of note is Nimrod. He was a mighty one on the earth, but not in a good way. He ruled over Babel, which was the first organized rebellion of humans against God. In fact, the name Nimrod itself means, let us rebel. Another commentator, he was a mighty hunter. That is, he was a violent invader of his neighbor's rights and properties, a persecutor of innocent men, carrying all before him and endeavoring to make all his own by force and violence. And so this is the individual that we're going to see on the scene ruling over Babylon, and arguably because of him being a great ruler and a great builder, he's arguably the one that started the idea of building this tower that reaches up to the heavens, if you will. Lastly, in this genealogy of chapter 10, we see Shem and his descendants. It covers verses 21 through 31. We see a couple of interesting points here in the first couple of verses. Reading along, it says, To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Aprakashad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram was Uz, Hol, Gether, and Mash. Aprakashad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So in this text, although Shem has multiple sons listed, whose names I probably didn't pronounce right, we see that Moses, the author, calls him the father of all the children of Eber. Now Moses does not call him the father of all of the children that we just listed, Elam, Asher, and so on, but rather he focuses on this guy named Eber, who is actually his great-grandson. So the purpose of this is to point, Moses is giving the readers a theological view that points us to the coming Savior. He is using this individual to explain that through this guy's lineage is going to come about this guy here in a couple hundred years named Abram, and through Abram to Isaac to Jacob, all the way to this guy who comes from this line known as Jesus, who's going to be the redeemer of his people. And so he's explaining to us, although it looks like Ham has the better part of this divide, if you will, God has a plan in which he's working all things out for his glory through this line of Shem and through Eber. The second thing we notice in this verse is it includes Japheth as the brother. We don't see it include this guy named Ham although we know Ham was his brother. We talked about how Japheth goes to the isles of the Gentiles, how Isaiah explains and talks about these, uh, the people in the isles of the Gentiles waiting for the coming law, being grafted into the promised face, the, the promised family of God. Here in the text, Moses includes this theological hint for us to see and read as he includes the brother of Japheth in the title of Shem. We know already at this point that Japheth and Shem are brothers, but why does the author include them? One commentator tells us, says, He was the brother of Japheth the elder, by which it appears that though Shem is commonly put first, he was not Noah's firstborn, but Japheth was older. But why should this also be put as part of Shem's title and description that he was the brother of Japheth, since it had been, in effect, often said before? And was, he not much, uh, and was he not as much a brother to Ham? Probably this was intended to signify the union of the Gentiles with the Jews in the church. 
The sacred historian had mentioned it as Shem's honor that he was the father of the Hebrews. But lest Japheth's seed should therefore be looked upon as forever shut out from the church, he reminds us here that he was the brother of Japheth, not in birth only, but in blessing also. For Japheth was to dwell in the tents of Shem. And so as we see this brief overview of these genealogies and where these individuals go and end up, this theological view that we can see um, on how it points to the coming Savior, the coming Redeemer, through Abraham and his seed, we also see in here a theological reminder of our depravity. We mentioned it earlier, we mentioned it last week, the week before last, that we talked about how man's wickedness leads to God flooding the earth and killing everybody except for eight individuals. And we see that only a few generations of descendants goes by before man turns back to his evil ways, as we see in chapter 11, and starts trying to make a name for themselves again as they build as they build this tower of Babel. And so we see and we're reminded here that we are a fallen people. It doesn't take long. It's not hard for us to quickly fall back into our sin. And hopefully this serves as a reminder to us as, as parents, as husbands, as fathers, that we are called to be diligent, to use every chance we are giving to pour into our kids the gospel. Just as how quickly we see in this text that sin creeps back into the family line, the same could happen to us if we're not careful, if we're not disciplined to make the gospel a priority in our life and in our family. And I want to explain, a priority is not simply showing up to church on Sunday morning. Dude, I want you to be here. I hope that you're here on Sunday morning, but that's, that's not enough. Let's be honest. If we think back, however many years you've been coming to church, you think back a year ago, Will and Jeremy preached on who knows what points they made. I don't know. I can't remember everything. There's a handful of sermons in my life that I look back and go, okay, when I was in Tennessee, I heard David Platt teach on writing a blank check, right? And that got me to be a, um, a elder candidate here at the church, and that led to me being a pastor here. There's a handful of sermons I could think about in my life that I remember. And so I hope that we're not naive that we have 52 times a year we meet here, 50 of which you probably don't remember the sermon. 52 total hours out of 8,760 hours in a year do we hope that that's really enough time to ground our family in the gospel? That somehow 52 hours is enough to help sanctify and lead our children closer to Jesus? It won't. It won't. We are very much so depraved and in need of grace in our life. It takes a daily commitment to teaching our children our families in the gospel, when we wake up, when we sit by the dinner table, when we play in the living room, when we put them down to sleep, are we grounding our children in the gospel? My point is not to say Sundays aren't important. They are. But church is not what God intended to be the main catalyst to teach our children about him. We are called on mission and as Pastor Jeremy just explained with this baby dedication, our first mission and priority is our family and our children. And so if you have placed any other mission above your family, above teaching your children the gospel, whether it's a good thing or not, you need to repent because you have not lived out God's obedience and call to lead your own family first. See, mine, Will, Stephen, Patrick, Jeremy, the elders of New Heights' main mission and main priority is not New Heights Church. It's not the members. It's not you guys. It's our family. It's our children. In fact, if we want to truly lead you guys well, we will lead you better by our actions in raising our children more than we could ever teach you on a sermon on Sunday morning. Second point, as we go into chapter 11, we see man's disobedience. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 11, it says, Now the whole earth had one language in the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. When they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves ourselves. 
lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. The first thing we see as we read this text is this constant use of the word let us. Let us do this. Let us build this great tower. Let us reach the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us be comfortable. We see that the focus of these descendants were not on Jesus. They were not on God. They were all about themselves. We see that man in his sinful state always attempts to make himself God. They failed to live up to the very first command that he gave to Noah after the flood when when God said, go into the earth and multiply. What did these descendants do? They found a great land that made them comfortable. They didn't want to multiply on the earth. In fact, they decided to build a tower that was waterproof just in case God got mad and decided to try to flood the earth again, that somehow their abilities and their knowledge to build this tower was going to keep God from scattering them again. They wanted to be in the place of God. We see that man's disobedience through the failure of following Christ's command See, they stop and they decide to live for themselves within the first four verses of chapter 11. We see their lack of obedience results in wanting to make their own name great. And so we see when we fail to obey God's will in our life, we are, by our actions, telling God that we care more about our own comfort, our own name, our own success, our own fill-in-the-blank We've created an idol in the place of God, and that idol is named Jeremy. That idol is named fill in the blank with your own name. See, when we look at what following God's will actually is, we see it perfected in the person of Jesus. We see that following God's will results in a radical life that says, I'm willing to give up my comfort, I'm willing to give up my home, I'm willing to give up my body, I'm willing to give up my life, not for my will, but for God's will to be accomplished. Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, if at all possible, let this, pa- let this cup pass from me. Talking about him being crucified shortly after. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. May we be a church and a people who could wake up daily and truly live out this idea of allowing God's will to take priority in what we think is our so important life. <clears throat> Just like in this story, Have we in our own life said it's so much easier and better if we just relax here where we're at? It'd be great if we just built new heights up so high that everyone around us knew. It'd be great if our name was built up so others could be amazed at what we've accomplished. If our actions are to make our own name great, our own church great, regardless of what actions might appear good in our own eyes, God doesn't want them. And my hope and prayer as a church is if we ever get to a point where New Heights name and fame is more important than God's glory, that God closes our doors. We are not the end goal. God's glory and his worth is our end goal. The name of our church was actually chosen to help fight against this sin, New Heights. The idea of always striving, never arriving. We always want to be getting uncomfortable. We always want to be pursuing God's will, which will take us to New Heights for his glory and our good. Now, on a side note, you hear us say this often, God's glory and our good, right? I say it backwards sometimes, say for our glory and God's good. But this this constantly finds its way in our speech, and there's a reason for that, and I want to explain. The purpose of this phrase, always finding its way into the speech of those behind this pulpit or those singing on Sunday morning, is that that statement is the essence of our existence, Our existence is to bring God glory in our life. That's it. The Westminster Confession of Faith says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so we need to get to a point where we live a life that every decision we make can be answered with the question of, does this bring God glory? This is what it means to live out his will and not our own. We see man's lack of trust in God's promises as they build this tower to the heavens. The construction, the type, the purpose of this tower was built in a reaction to the lack of God's promises that he wouldn't flood the earth again. It says in those last couple of verses that we read, lest we be scattered among the earth. They build this tower. They waterproof 
with the materials that they used for the construction of this tower. <clears throat> One commentator writes, Let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had asphalt for mortar. Using baked bricks and asphalt for mortar, men built a tower that was both strong and waterproof. Even as Noah used the same material in waterproofing the ark in Genesis 6.14, later Moses' mother used the same materials in waterproofing the basket in Exodus 2. And so the question is, how often in our life, maybe not by our words, but by our actions, do we doubt God's promises? As you read Scripture, and you see the many promises that's made to the church, to Israel, to us, which one is the hardest for you to truly trust in and believe? The great theologian, uh, Joel Olstein, he, uh, he actually made a post on social media uh, maybe last week, and it's actually a really good post, so we're going to quote him today, all right? Maybe he was hacked, I'm not sure, but his comment says, when we're trying to make up for our sins... What we're really saying is Jesus didn't finish everything on the cross. I've got to pay for this one. The truth is your blood would not do any good. It was the spotless, sinless blood of the lamb that paid the price in full. Now note, this is the only good quote you're ever going to hear from Joel Osteen. But nonetheless, there's truth in it. Right? He's, he is painting this picture. Do you truly believe that when Jesus said to tell us that it is finished, that every sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future, was fully paid for? Does our actions live in a way that show that we trust that when God says, I'm going to hold you in my hands and nothing can rip you out of me, that that's true? Does our actions mimic that? Does it show that we believe that promise? And so the moment we start to doubt or question what God has said is the very moment we allow sin to take control of our life again. Look at Adam and Eve, right? What was the goal of the serpent? To get them to doubt God's promises, to get them to doubt what God had told them. Serpent says, are you sure that God meant what he said when he said this? Failure to trust in God's promises to his people results in sinful action taking to make ourselves more important than God. And what a beautiful thing we see that God do next here in the text. We see God's justice mercifully poured out on these people for their disobedience, their sin. We see God's mercy in keeping his promise. We see God's mercy in his patience and his long-suffering. We see God's mercy in the picture of what this act shows us later in Scripture. So our third point talks about God's mercy. Verses 5 through 9, it says, And the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So I would argue that although this is God's justice on display, we see his mercy even more so in this text. We see God's mercy through his promise. Right? He promised Noah and his people. He says, hey, that bow that I put in the sky, the rainbow, let that serve as a reminder to you that I will never wipe out mankind with a flood again. Now, God could have easily went down to Babel and wiped them out and killed them and been completely just in doing so for their sin and their wickedness. But God doesn't. He keeps his promise. He doesn't flood them again. He doesn't wipe them out. Instead, he confuses the language as his choice of justice here. So we see his patience on display by doing this. We see this choice of justice. He reminds by his actions the promises that he made to them. The same way we see man choose sin and distrust by their actions is the same way God reminds them of his will and his promises by his actions. The beauty of this text, this form of justice here, says that God came down to them. God is meeting them where they are at. 
Scripture says that God came down to see what was happening. God comes down to meet sinners in their sin. And if this isn't the best news to those who are helpless in their sin, I don't know what is. The same actions that God has taken to this sinful group of people is the same action he has taken for you and me. God has came down to us through Jesus to meet us where we are at in our sins. Scripture says that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that's when Christ came to us. If you think for one second that there's something you have to do to meet God somewhere, there's a tower you have to build to make it high enough to the heavens before God comes to you, you're wrong. There's no amount of good in your life. There's no tower big enough you can build. There's no amount of uh, deeds you can do to somehow get you closer to Jesus. God comes to the base of that tower in the midst of your sin for you. See, God does all the work. And all he's saying is, trust in me, follow my will, repent of your idols, repent of your sin, repent of your lack of faith in my promises, and follow me in obedience. We see in this text that God's mercy leads back to his will. God's original ask of these people, the first ask after the flood was to go into the earth and multiply. These people failed to do that. We see God, through his justice, makes his will accomplished. God used his justice to spread them across the earth for his will to take effect. God says by his actions, if you are not going to obey me and accomplish my will through obedience, I will accomplish my will through your disobedience. I will scatter you myself to make my will accomplished. We see God's mercy put into check man's high view of self. One commentator writes, So the Lord scattered them abroad. The forced separation of men from Babel was more God's mercy than his judgment. God, in dividing man, both linguistically and geographically, put a check on the power of man's fallen nature. And so we see God, through his justice and judgment on these people, serves as a reminder of our constant failure and our constant need for grace and mercy in our life. It's a clear reminder that in comparison to the power of God, we are nothing. The humility that has came and fallen upon these people. The fear that these people had at such an interesting act of confusing the languages. The need of communication in life fully ripped away from these individuals. You see, God's mercy will always lead us to a point of realizing our depravity and our need for him. We see this, this beautiful comparison here with this idea of language where, where God scatters the individuals here in the Old Testament. He confuses the language. We see this comparison to what he does later in the book of Acts. We see this merciful act that leads to bringing about God's will. In the Old Testament, we see God's will accomplished through the scattering, through the confusing of languages. And in Acts, we're going to see his will accomplished through the uniting of languages. So Acts chapter 2, verse 2. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling there in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound of the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? So what a beautiful picture we get to see as a New Testament saint looking backwards between these stories. We see God in the Old Testament scatters their language to accomplish his will of spreading them across the earth. And in the New Testament, God unites the language to bring about his will through the spreading of the gospel and grafting in of all people groups. So if you ever wondered why you are where you are in your life, why has this happened to you, good or bad? There's a 100% chance that God has placed things in your life, good and bad, for his will to be accomplished. 
This use of scattered language in Genesis or united language in Acts serve as the perfect reminder that God's will will be accomplished. Our lives will bring about God's will and his glory, whether in our, dis- whether in our obedience in Acts or through our disobedience like in Genesis. Romans makes it very clear that your life will bring God glory, whether through repentance as a trophy of grace or rather through disobedience as a vessel of wrath to display God's justice and holiness. My hope for everyone here and God's will for everyone here is that his, his will is accomplished through your repentance and faith in Christ and not the latter. 